For the last 15 years, Adam Montiel has been bringing you the stories, the people, and the producers that make wine better and more fun. Whether you're a connoisseur or a cork, here we taste it, we spill it, we leave it all on the table. It's The Pour with Adam Montiel. today that you are starting to hear a lot more of and are really excited because they seem to do so great here. And that, those are Albarino and Tanat. Uh, Nancy is here from Uyoa. We got a string of great winemakers here, but I know I'm losing you in a few minutes, so I wanted to say hi to you and make sure we talked about your Albarino. Hola, Adam. How are Muchas you? Gracias for having me here. It's I'm so very, great. Always very to excited see you. to be here with you, and I'm very excited to be part of this awesome event. I think the Central Coast is doing a lot of really cool things, and I think this is one that is going to bring a lot of people on. It's definitely going to continue to be a thing in the years to come, I hope. Yeah. Tell me about you. How have things been going? Things have been going amazing. I mean, I, you know, I'm coming up on a year having my tasting room and then increasing my production, and I just became self employed. So, to Ooh. follow my dream, yeah. of, <laughs> it's exciting and really scary. But, but I think that anything worth doing, it's always going to bring a little bit of fear. And I, I love a challenge. I mean, I moved to the Central Coast to learn how to make wine with no previous education. And I think it's a testament of how amazing the community is to embrace people who are outsiders, who who have a passion to be part of this. I feel like if I would have gone somewhere else to like Napa, maybe that wouldn't have happened no, as easily no. as yeah, it happened no. here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I'm just really taking advantage of that and like wanting to give a name to all the really awesome varieties. I'm very passionate about obscure varieties. And even though I'm only pouring Albarino at the festival, my fiance and I also did make Tanat last year. We actually met because of Tanat. No way. And so the festival is just like very meaningful to me and my career and like the direction that my brand is going. Tie the knot with Tanat. <laughs> there we, go. we actually uh, so yeah. we met because of Seven Ox and Tanak because I was working there and right. we looking for it. So for our wedding, we're going to be pouring oh, uh, Seven cool. Ox and Tanak. Hopefully, the same vintage. What like. was so, oh the vintage? Yeah, it's so cool. What were some of the things that you learned as we're rounding out the first year of having your tasting room? Things that maybe you're like, oh shit, didn't expect that, or um, you know. I think one of the biggest lessons is to not try to imitate a- anyone's journey. I think that we all have different ways of doing things and not one thing it's right unless it feels right to you. And so I have been learning to just follow my intuition and do the things that genuinely make me happy rather than to try to like come up with like content and schedules and things like that. I feel like having the freedom to do exactly what I want has given the identity of my brand so much like love from the community because they're seeing someone who started from the bottom and has been somewhat struggling, but in a very beautiful way of sharing my journey so that other people can be inspired to follow their dreams as well. I'm kind of in your boat too, where I'm like for the first time learning like, oh, I'm taking this brand podcasting thing independently it's like my own business now like it is very different you know yeah. how do you kind of wrestle with the aspects of that that you might not be inherently good at I mean, because i'm noticing pieces mm-hmm. in what i'm doing now like when i have like a client go hey adam you forgot to send me an invoice like oh that's right i need to get paid for this <laughs> you know or things like that how do you kind of go okay these aren't things i'm inherently good at but I know all the talents that I do have and I'm trying mm-hmm. to use and serve with, but I still need to kind of like learn these other things really well. I ask for help. Yeah. And I also have learned to invest in the things that really might take time and a skill that I don't have. Because at the beginning when I started my business, I wanted to learn how to do everything I like. I was like, I'll do my licensing. I'll do my taxes. I'll do this. I'll do that. And then soon enough, I realized that I didn't want to do those things. And so instead of seeing it as like spending money on this, it's like I'm investing money for someone who's a professional to do the things that they're good at so that I can have the time to be creative and to go out and get inspiration from like other winemakers or even just to like a lot of the things that I do with my winemaking and my life in general, it just put a lot of like my spirituality and my beliefs into what I do and that really really i need space for that so delegating these things to people that know how to do it is the best advice that i could give you yeah let someone do your invoicing your taxes all that stuff (laughs) and then concentrate on having fun with what you're doing yeah enjoying it i love it so it doesn't feel like so much work it doesn't i'm like i pinch myself every day knowing that i i get to do this for a living 
So yeah. drink wine, sell wine, talk about wine. You do you, know. all, you do a whole lot of like offbeat whites. Yes, that's U.S. sellers concentrates in all whites. So my my signature is Gruner Veltliner. I make Verse, Albariño, Semillon, Verdejo, and Pinot Blanc. And then I'm adding a few more this harvest. So. so does this mean at some point we're going to bring reds into the mix, but under a different name? Yeah, so that's the Witch and the Warlock. So my fiance and I, that's our brand together. And so last harvest, we also were both nerds when it comes to wine so we uh, originally we said we're gonna make one wine we're gonna make tanat and then we started adding more we so we added last harvest we did tanat gamay sangiovese fun petit verdot and cafranc wow so we have a full Some lineup of reds fun yeah. stuff when do those look to come online i think the lighter like the sancho and the gamay we're looking at bottling maybe in like february mm-hmm. and then the rest we're gonna give them a little bit more time yeah we have to be patient i don't know how to do that no but that's i'm like you if i was gonna come out with a brand well audrey and i made one wine the peak pool blanc the peak pool which blanc. i'm still waiting for that bottle i saw i should have brought <laughs> so but yeah with that skin contact it's good it's tasting really good right oh, now that's but exciting. i knew i had to do a white yeah because yeah. I don't want to wait for it. Exactly. So that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons. Um, I mean, besides the fact that I love all these white varieties, I yeah. think that it's just a quick turnaround. So. Yeah. Well, thanks for hanging Thank with us. Thank you so much for including me. I, I appreciate, appreciate you. I can't wait to see you. Uh, how can people learn more about Uyoa? Uh, they can go on latinawinemaker.com. Or, I mean, Uyoa sellers is a little hard for people I know, to remember yeah. how to pronounce it. Or like. It's so funny because if you ever took one Spanish class, <laughs> you and the double L... It's really not as hard, but for some reason, yep. ocularly, it looks tough. Yes. Yeah. But if you just don't stress on it and just go, oh, yeah, ooh, yo. The double easy. L is pronounced as a Y, yeah. so ooh, yo. And it's right. my mom's maiden name. That's why I, I chose that. But, yeah, they can find Honestly, me. Honestly, I love the Latina Winemaker. You know, cause... Latina Winemaker.com. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. I, I appreciate love it. you. Oh, you're Thank the best, you. Nancy. We'll chat soon again. Thank you. All right, cool. But, uh, Damien, that was awesome. Albarino, this was something that originally started with the Albarino Summit. We did this, I don't know, three, well, it was before COVID, but you've done it about three times, right? Right, yep, yep. Yeah, we did three very six, and they got bigger and bigger every year. I think there was one at Brecon, and then there was one at Broken Earth and Derby, and then the next, there was a, a third one too. It, it, it's it's interesting going back to these things, and there's so many accents floating around. I mean, obviously, I've got an accent, Nancy's got an accent, Bastian's got an accent. Mm-hmm. You know, the, an accent. The, yeah. all these all these <laughs> Canadians yeah, yeah, yeah. we've got here. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so they all sound the same. We're going to talk about this event because it, it entails a panel. We're going to break things down. And we have some more folks. I can't wait to talk about all of whether it's Albarino or Tanat. Adam Lazar is here. It is good. And we're at your, your spot right here. So thanks for having us. Yeah, no, oh my God, I'm glad to have visitors because outside of you guys, I got no one coming over here. It's like really lonely. <laughs> this is the coolest <laughs> loft, though. It's like we were like at this super secret location, downtown Paso, overlooking downtown. We got windows on two sides of us. That extend the whole wall. I mean, this is really a sweet spot. This is where we plan the complete domination of the wine industry. Yeah. Passer, right here. Right here. You're talking, to the, you're talking to the peeps right here to make it happen. Will Broadside do like tastings in here where you host like trade or what is this beautiful? It's got to be used for something it's more than just me. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, no, no. It's, actually, we did this all for you. Right. So yeah, we're all good. Yeah. No, we, we actually, this is the Broadside Tasting Room. I also host people who want to come in and taste Lazar wines, which is Albarino. Right. But uh, we bring in VIP visitors, distributors from around the country. We get in sales teams. We get in wine writers. Uh, we host a lot of them. And people who just want to kind of hang out and be a block from downtown. Yes. I can make some phone calls, get them into our favorite restaurants and visit our favorite winery and say, hey, Damien, I got a great group of people. They want to come in and try some great Albarino. Yeah. Give them a call and, and it's done. What is it about Albarino that excites you? I'll tell you. So I fell in love with Albarino when I, was, I had a project that I was getting ready to start in Spain. I originally wanted to work with Verdejo and in the Rueda region uh, outside of the city of Valladolid. And that never came to fruition, but I really fell in love with Albarino. I started talking to a number of the winemakers. And, you know, at the time, we were really looking for an alternative to Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, which are really the two leaders, white wine leaders in, in the United States. And what Albarino for me brings, it's it's got the weight and complexity of a really good Chardonnay, which I think is a very difficult wine to make because as evidenced by all the bad ones that are out there, and Sauvignon Blanc, which is very aromatic, but it can be a little one-dimensional at times. But Albarino offers so much more. And what's really cool is a very fastidious grape. It, it is it's an aromatic variety, so the flavors are already in the grape. So you can taste the Albarino grape. You can kind of taste the flavors, how it's going to develop. But it, it really 
will depending on how you produce it, when you pick it, uh, you know, uh, Nancy was talking about neutral barrel fermentations versus tank fermentations. And I do a lot of the same thing, a combination of the two. My two favorite albarinos in, in Spain, Rios Baixas, come, or one is done in stainless steel, the other is done entirely in barrel. And so my philosophy is like, okay, well, I'm just going to blend the two together. And it's see so interesting because it... you compare it to Chardonnay with the complexity it has, but Chardonnay is often stroked with wood mm-hmm. when Albarino, you, like you just mentioned, the flavor is really in the grape. So that's, is that probably why we see it more either in stainless or neutral? Yeah. And, I th- and that's the case. You don't want to, you don't want to bury the flavors of an aromatic white with wood, with wood. And when I talk about Chardonnay and comparing it as being a fastidious grape, yes, Oak is an important part of, of Chardonnay production. You don't, that's why you don't see a lot of stainless steel, mm-hmm. no oak Chardonnays anymore. However, all of the input that you give to a Chardonnay can make it a very, very, very complex wine. And so that's really what, I'm, what, what my, my, my thought processes were. I do want to just give a little, mention something about the guy who would be considered kind of the father of Albarino in the United States, Alan Kinney, who brought the first commercial cuttings over here. He passed away a couple of months ago. Oh, man. And so I just wanted to, he is, I spend hours talking to him and his philosophy on Albarino. He was the guy that brought in all the cuttings. Where's, where was his brand? Is that the... Where he, he, he'd been at Cali Paso, but he had also okay. been in, in Virginia and made wine up in Oregon for many years. I think he was at... Martin Wyrick. Martin Wyrick. Who was at Martin yeah. Wyrick. He was Wyrick. Wyrick. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so he, he passed away. Uh, from a, a long-term illness, but uh, I just wanted to just uh, give a shout, sh- him out, shout, yeah. him, shout him out because, because we have the, we have the it, Kinney clone of Albarino, which right. which yeah. may, be, may be the best Albarino in, in the United States. So. And Jason, maybe you can kind of shout out on this. I know we talked about it on the Up and Adam show, and that was kind of like Albarino. If you look at where it's planted most in California, that Paragon Vineyard is it by far. Oh yeah, I think I think Paragon is the largest plant in Albarino. I think there's 67 acres of great of Albarino there. Yeah, and, and I mean, and and Adam's right. I mean, that's all due to Alan Kenny. I mean, I, that vineyard was planted, I believe, 27 years ago. That in the Jack Ranch next door, and I everything from what I've heard was that that was all due to the influence of Alan Kinney and him and his obsession with Albarino. Now this event tackles both Tanat and Albarino like it did from the original. You actually make both. I try to. Yeah. <laughs> I try really hard. What is it that excites you about Albarino? And then we'll talk about Tanat. I love, I mean, I remember Alber- getting exposed to Albarino when I was early in my career and I was actually making wine in Humboldt County for a guy and he was obsessed with Albarino because of how close of proximity it glued- grew to the ocean. By the way, we're talking to Jason Bouchon, Bouchon Wines. Thanks. I appreciate that. Well, make sure people I'm listen so to glad go- to be here. I'm, we're talking with Adam Montiel. Yeah. Adam Montiel. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And so anyway, I, I remember hearing about this grape and then I don't know why. Oh, I, a close friend of mine was growing some here locally and that's Greg Barr. And he said, I have extra albarino. So I thought, oh, I'm going to try to make it. And then that's where my exploration and journey began. And then, like I said, his vineyard became removed and then I moved to the Edna Valley and I've only made it from the Edna Valley off of Paragon for the last seven years, I believe. And so, do you yeah. go stainless, neutral? What do you do? I do both. I do partial. Well, I ferment under temp in a, in, a, in a jacketed stainless tank, and then I rack down with lees to stainless drums and neutral French, and then I put about 30% of it through malolactic and then put it all back together for bottling. And yeah, Nancy was talking about that a little bit, right? Like letting it go a little bit through ML? Yeah. So I think she said she put all of hers through ML. We had an issue, I believe, in 22 where, you know, because of the heat wave in September that year, that the grapes just kind of stunted. And the we're always waiting for Albarino for the acid to come down. Yeah. And uh, so, but we don't want it to get too ripe because we don't want, you know, high alcohol either. I think that would be an awkward mix for that variety. But anyway, so that year we didn't get the acid to drop and I felt like I want to round this out a little bit more than just, than just the age. We only age it for five months before bottling. So I thought let's put some of it through malolactic and, and we did and we put it all back together and we really liked the result. And so that's just our protocol going forward. Now, before we dive deep into Tanat, Sherry, I know you are coming to the event, going to be expressing some Albarino. You're also on the panel. And what is it about this grape that Jason just broke down, which I'm so glad the way you did and kind of explained that, that really excites you as a winemaker? Well, as Jason and Adam were talking about, what I appreciate the most about making Albarino is the amount of patience that it takes. 
the patients start in the vineyard, first of all, as, as Jason was saying, are trying to get those ripe flavors and, you know, trying to tame the acidity, but also you don't want too high of alcohol. And I make a sparkling Albarino and also a still Albarino, but for the sparkling, it's really tricky to get the perfect pick. I'm purposely picking it with a lower sugar and higher acidity to make my cuvee, but you don't want the um, green flavors. You know, I don't want lemongrass. I don't want like celery seed, the herbalness. So you're waiting for that to shift in ripeness to get this like honeydew, pomelo, grapefruit. But there's a fine line there too, because you also can't wait for it to get too ripe. So it's, it's having patience in the vineyard and getting that that right pick just right on where the the chemistry will always look great and then you're tasting you're tasting and then finally the flavors are there and you you can pull the trigger and then there's also a lot of patience in the cellar it's just so acidic anyways as a grape and then especially as a sparkling it's really acidic so we always you know are anxious it's one of our best sellers in the rava tasting room we want to open it we want to release it but it really has to lay down on tourage on the lees to get this fullness and richness in the middle and it's a it's this balance of you know is it ready now is it now is it now and you're tasting it and you're tasting it and it really you know takes a couple years to lay down before you get the richness and the softness in the middle kind of that lemon meringue but it also finishes just crisp and you know, it has a salinity, almost this cool saltiness that, you know, comes from the ocean influence. And I just, I love the wine because it's so versatile with oysters, you know, seafood. And I think it's also fantastic on its own. It's just, you know, I, my go-to white wine is always Albarino. I just love it. Yeah. Is it one of these wines where you talked about it sitting on its leaves that you kind of stir it up and agitate it so that that batonage, they call it, right, to give it that mouthfeel? Or... Yeah, exactly. So for the still Albarino, and actually also for the Cuvée sparkling base, I am putting it on in oak, a neutral oak, but also lee stirring it. And, you know, I'm not trying to get oak influence. I don't, that's not really what I'm, what I want in my wine. I'm trying to get the mid palate weight you know, kind of a creaminess and texture, just a layer to, to balance the pretty harsh acidity that can come with it. And that's the the style we make. I, you know, I want like a nice light pineapple. I'm not going for a super huge stone fruit mango style. I like a little lower alcohol and I like it to be crisp and acidic. And, you know, some people can make it a little different. Get it, sourcing our grapes from Monterey gives us that natural acidity and we get a lot less sugar than making an Albarino and Paso Robles. That's so a little richer and riper. So yeah, two very different styles. But yeah, I, I think uh, what I love the most is the acidity and also this really cool ginger spice kind of kick that you get at the end. I just, I love that about it too. I'm so curious about the sparkling aspect since, you know, Rav is here and I love Rav. I love what Lauren and Chad are doing. But the idea of, okay, so we're taking Method Champenois. This is that secondary fermentation happening in the bottle. This is the way all the big champagnes are also made. It also takes a long time. I have a friend in, in Slow who is, you know, he made an Albarino, but it's just force carbonating it at the end. He makes a great wine. Then you force the bubbles inside. And in the end, most people don't give a shit they're like well bubbles bring it you know <laughs> so when do, does it ever happen where like you think of a either a varietal or a skew or whatever where method champenois yes or maybe just do it this way you know what i mean it's almost kind of like a rosé do we gonna are we just gonna do a bleed are we gonna do it pick it early or or do, you know what are those conversations and when you're making a sparkling wine do you think varietally specific as to what is going to be good with secondary fermentation yeah, definitely. But also, you know, what I think is so cool and what's unique about Rava is besides just Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, you know, your three traditional champagne grapes, we actually make about 14 different sparkling varieties, all method champenoise. And and I think that's actually what makes us unique about Paso is um, we're not stuck with the traditional grapes. And so I think if the acidity is there and the chemistry is there and you have the right vineyard pick, almost anything could be sparkling. And and I'm not opposed to, you know, the Prosecco Charmant method. I think it's a style choice. You want it to be fresh and fruity and, you know, fresh to the market. You don't want the yeasty aging characteristics. Uh, that's not what we do. But I think, you know, there's a, a market for that. Oh, sure. But yeah, so I, I actually had to write down a list. I was trying to think of all the sparklings we make. But, you make um, a ton. So yeah, what we're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, you know so I have a, <laughs> as I was sitting there like, wait, we make everything. Um, so we have Pinot Blanc, Pique Blanc, Grenache Blanc, Cinso, 
Grenache Noir, uh, Rosé, Riesling, Muscat, Albrino, a couple Chardonnays, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. We do a Gruner. Man. Are those all Method Champenois? Yeah, everything we do is Method Champenois. And, yeah. and then we also do some, some blends as well, a blend of those. But what I think is really cool is we're, you know, getting ready to launch kind of a, which I think a Paso will love, is we're getting ready to launch a Rhone line of sparklings with the um, Cinso and the Grenache Blanc and the Pete Pool Blanc. Dang. And I think, you know, I think people will love it. It's, yeah. Rhone's do great here. Oh, yeah. I heard. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I love, love Grenache Blanc. It's, it's yeah, always yeah. such a fun white to just slam and hang out, sunshine like Grenache Blanc. And, yeah. It's you know, beautiful here. Yeah. Pools, delivers the acid, great with food. So much fun. Before we get into Scott, Damien, this is an event that will highlight both Albarino and Tanat. Tell us the deets on the event and how many different folks we have showing up to it. I'm salivating after all this talk anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> and it's being hosted at uh, Broken Earth Winery, which is on Ramada Drive in Paso Robles. They've got this wonderful building. It's lovely air conditioning on what could be a hot day. It's going to be We're warm. starting to see it. Yeah, we're starting to see some warmth. It's great for flowering. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. They serve pizzas as well. They've got this massive brick oven thing that they... Yeah, they've got a great setup over there. So there's uh, plenty of food. If there are tickets left, some of the things like the seminars and the dinners, there's only a couple of tickets left. But if you go to 805tickets.com and... Uh, five ticks, my 805 ticks, ticks. Yeah, my 805 ticks, you've got it. And you I'll just, put a link in the show notes. Oh, uh, yeah, Alternative Taste Festival, and you'll find all about the Albarino and Tanat Festival. And we've got 27 different wineries pouring a lot of them are pouring both Alvarino and Tanat because it, it, it's those explorers and people are interested in the new and up and coming things well th- these varieties are both that so yeah broken earth themselves are pouring both varieties uh, we could pour, pour both uh, and, and so on and so on and so on yeah so lots of lots of different wines to try and lots of different styles just we've been tasting now you've got Alvarino's in stainless tell talk about this wine in the glass right now you just poured for us well that's actually not mine i think it's, it's not to talk oh good about i thought it was yours okay got but it we, we did pour one of mine earlier which was an Alvarino done with acacia wood everyone here said don't over oak it don't over oak it and we don't we we, we put in acacia instead and the reason is it doesn't give you the toast it doesn't give you the vanilla but it still gives you body. And we have talked about adding body to the mid-palate. And it also changes up a little bit. It, it changes it from more a citrusy thing to more of a stone fruit thing. So it kind of moves it slightly towards the the Chardonnay spectrum, if you like. So, yes, we do a number of different Albarino stylistically and Tanats. We... I, I may pull a Tanat out of the cellar for the, for the day. It'll be a surprise for everyone there. So okay. we have planted our own so this might be the first sighting of uh, really a brecken and tanat in the wild roll the so curtains back baby you, do you, it you may have to come to the <laughs> let's dive deep in this cave come on you on belay have, this saturday coming up june ju- june 8th jason your wine is in the glass right now this is, is this true yeah lean into that mic my man yeah tell me about this I, th- I don't know why i thought this was the brecken label i'm so sorry I think we've just been like randomly pouring everything at this point. Uh, but no, but you know what? <laughs> I, don't, I see my, like a different wine in everybody's glass. In my I know in brain d- defense, no, that's there was whiskey in your glass right now. There so was, was, there, was that, there was that one wine that Brecken did a year ago where it's like it looks like a designer bag and it kind of like has that like infinite oh, yeah. pattern, you know? Oh, the yeah. Louis Breton. Yeah, label. the Louis yeah, Breton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Louis yeah. Breton yeah. label. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, this one, yeah. dude. This is like <laughs> this is like a cavern of like flavors out of the glass. I mean, yeah. this one's just climbing out at you yeah this is a pretty nice wine so this is a this is a, a different tier that we haven't really released yet we really? are going to pour these at the event and actually we're pouring one at the dinner on friday as well this is a tier called analogique which is just analog french for analog we have a big music vibe in our in our tasting room and in my life and i and i tend to like to listen to vinyl and i have like an all tube sound system so i'm big in analog and this is just an extension of what we already do but this is like the top tier that we make when i was in college doing one of my first radio classes i remember the guy was a he's an incredible instructor this like really like you know verbose kind of dude and you know he was called everybody by their three names adam william montiel like if he was addressing you or whatever your name was anyways he would always talk about the difference between analog and digital which were so perfect 
as we are sweeping into a very digital time, was analog. Well, tell you first, the digital is representative. When you look at a clock, it says 644. It's representative of it being 644. Analog means actual. That is what's actually it is. When you see that clock, those hands moving, that is an actual representation of what time it is. And I love how to have a wine, especially one of your, you know, your upper echelon representatives of what you're doing, to be like pretty much known as like actual. This is it. This is actual. That's a great way to sum- summarize it. I appreciate it. That, that's better than I could do. In fact, the interview's over. <laughs> you can take that. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, I, analog is great. I mean, we. I, it started with me with sound. Analog yeah. is like, analog is how our ears work. It's a physical thing. It's, it's actual actually, sound, exactly, right? Exactly. It's actually taking place. It's that needle piercing that, Correct. you know, that right. vinyl in the... So yeah, this is, this is just our taking that idea to the 10th degree. And yeah. this is a blend of Tanat and Cabernet. 50, how do you get G? Too. Have you turn out to I, 11? I paid a lot of money for yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I paid Bill Gibbs a lot of money and yeah. I got to not. So, he, um, he's my neighbor. He won't let me have any fruit. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Yeah. But I am going to drop off 800 albums at your uh, tasting room. So yes, they're, right, they're all 38 yeah. special albums. By you've the way. been saying that for a while, Adam. I, you've been telling me. You just say, I got these really cool albums, man. You yeah, no, I'm being forced now to get them out of my yeah, There you go. So, oh, you are being yeah, forced. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's that. And uh, yeah, so this is. This is a small production. I mean, I think I made... And literally 50-50 down the line? Yeah. Tonight, it was a cabin. barrel of each one. There it was a go. barrel of Cabin and a barrel of Tanat. It's fantastic, yeah. by the yeah, way. Yeah, it really, is. really, really good. It, it, I poured this at an event in Orange County on Saturday, and it was pretty well received. Yeah, well, yeah. I think honestly, what you did with the front, what we did with the the you know visually, it's yeah. It's that so cool that scene. design was done by Nicole Nicole Kirkpatrick at oh. Current Drifter. Yeah, yeah, you know, Nicole Nicole yeah. Joy. I mean, her... I, I I did a panel. I hosted a panel that she was on. Yes, uh, at the bottling. Or yeah, at the label place. customizable. Correct. She's fantastic. Yeah, what Nicole a does a great job. Yeah, and, she knows and, her shit. Yeah, so she designed. Good for you, we man. wanted something that was like kind of elegant and with the embossing and the foiling, and it looks really. It's really a cool label. Scott, really let's like talk that. about Tanat, man. I'm excited to hear what is passionate about Tanat that you were really like lit up about. Well, I have to say that Adam, you're probably pretty guilty of of being the reason why I'm going broke. <laughs> So, Why is this? So Denise, my wife, and I, when we bought the vineyard in 2019, and we started to think about, you know, are we going to be producer sellers or producer winemakers? And you know, after I think episode three with you and Eric, when Eric, oh, was, where wine takes you? Yeah. Oh yes. When when Eric was just fluffing up Paso. Yeah, he's and, good at and, it too. And yeah, well, he is the ultimate performer. Uh, that's right. And sure. promoter. So that was, you know, that's what gave us the, the confidence to do it. Oh, um, that's cool, then, man. You know, checking out, I mean, we were driving up and down the five for, you know, once a week coming from the OC as we were building. The is that right? Yeah, yeah. So we wow. went through a lot of podcasts. So I'm onto your game and, <laughs> 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 but no, it's, it's not, it's just, you know, we, my first tonight was Brecken. So when we were scouting out places and we started to see Tanat popping up on, you know, tasty menus, the first one that I had was from Brecken. And then we saw when the vineyard was, it was vineyard was planted in 2007. So established Tempranillo Tanat. When we saw what Brecken was doing with Tanat, we knew, okay, we're going to keep that, that rootstock. We're going to keep the, that clone and we're going to, we're going to see what we can do with Tanat. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating grape. You know, a, a lot of people pick it too early. You know, they don't get it phenolics going and that's where you get that that green really kind of nasty to not bad rap does it have a bad rap in those aspects i didn't know that okay yeah i can i mean again if you if you don't let it ripen and then when you press it you overpress it and you start cracking those seeds there's five seeds in a berry versus Ooh. two to three there's Ooh, a okay. lot of greenness that you can introduce into the wine so there's a lot going on there yeah that I had no idea. Would well, you blend with it, or do you make it on its own too? We do single varietal, which you'll have in a little bit, and we blend. Uh, we do a Tempranillo Tanat blend. We do a Petite Syrah Tempranillo Tanat blend. We do Tanat Syrah. So you know, lots of tools in a toolbox. How many years has Crush Vineyard been around? Starting well, we bought it in nineteen. First harvest was twenty twenty. And welcome, welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my hair wasn't gray four years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bought a, bought a winery, made, you know, birthed a winery, and then Daddy Newsom says you can't do anything with it. Yeah, yeah you can, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. I can, you can't. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
It's a great journey. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. But how has it been? It's great. I mean, it's, it's everything that we thought it would be and even more. You're in Tin City. That's got to be fun. Yeah. That was, a, that was a long kind of process to get in there. But was we, it? Yeah. It's just, you know, Mike, rest in peace. Of course. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course. You know, he was, sure. He's particular. And he no, no. He sure. does. He was really trying to yeah. curate something very specific. Yeah. And it's, you know, and that, that, that energy continues. Yeah. And it's just, it's great camaraderie. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. I mean, so great. The yeah. people there, incredible. Yeah. And then the annex side. It's, yeah. I mean, it's really just a little, it's almost like a little bridge street over. It's, and you got it's, UMCV, there's a candy so company. Close. Oh, it's my so God. Close. It's right there. It's all the same property. You know, if people have had a little bit too much, if they, sometimes they walk over to the annex and they've had a little bit too much. Yeah. Denise will drive them back and over to the yeah. Tin City proper. I think I think you were I think you just let Tin City Distillery. We'll take you back. Yeah. <laughs> Tin County to Tin City. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then but what's really cool, and I know that they've been very particular about what is quote properly Tin City, but I think most people, again, they don't really know the boundaries of who owns this or who owns what. People are excited to see industrial and urban tastings yep. that are exciting and growing and what Ramada Row is doing and like what Eric Ponce and Rachel mm-hmm. Ponce are going to bring to that area with the front room. I mean, I think in one, two years, that place is not even going to look. We think it's growing now. I mean, I think you just look at the diversity of wines in Paso, but look at the diversity of tasting experiences. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can be out in the vineyard. You can be in downtown. Zip you lining be, over Pinot vineyards. I mean, it's crazy. You know, out in a, you know, Tin City. You know, it's where do you get that? Yeah. You don't. What was it about Paso that made, your, made you... You guys go, yeah, no, that's us. That we got to be, got to be there. Well, we started out, I would say, early '90s, Napa, Napa, Napa. You know, cab snob, cab snob. But we knew it then, even back in the early '90s, and you know, it was just not accessible, and it was just too pigeonholed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we saw the diversity, well, even they're thinking and seeing that now. I mean, you got like Juan Mercado here, Helen Kepplinger here. I mean, yeah. you know, a lot of brands swallowing up things here because now they're seeing like, oh, I can grow, make whatever I yeah. want. Yeah, there's you're. Who else can grow 65 plus varietals and do it well? Amen. Yeah, you're absolutely right, yeah. dude. So you see something exciting about here. What made you decide urban, industrial, where one, you're just thinking like, hey, well, we're not getting, I don't know, do you have a custom, I mean, do you have a state fruit or we're not getting a state fruit, so let's yeah. just go here? So, I don't know. you know, the majority is state, state fruit. We've been grafting in some Grenache. We've added some Petite Syrah. So probably the only thing that we'll source going forward will be Syrah. Where's your state? So West Side, just a couple miles out town adelaida okay you know where scott's boat repair is uh uh-uh. you know scott's... where cemetery is yes hang a right on mustang springs we're back there oh okay cool yeah. there's a there's a couple of little vineyards back there you know one of dow's patrimony vineyards yeah there. that's right yeah. i was just gonna say he used to live out there then i think of like isn't like mighty cap out there mighty caps yeah yeah, yeah no i know exactly where yeah. you're talking about us. good for you that's kind of fun it is fun what are we growing out there we're doing tempranillo tonight grenache you ever want to host people out there? Or is that just kind of the home and vineyard? We will. We we could. I mean, you know, we're not doing production there. Okay. Uh, so you know, we had a box to check. You know, buy the no, vineyard, build a house, don't buy equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we are crushing. We're actually crushing with uh, Tyler Russell. Oh, that's yeah. that's some fun company. Yeah, no, it's it's a good time. Yeah, oh, good for you, man. Well, it's really cool to like finally get a chance to really kind of understand your story. The Crush Vineyard, that's very kind of a you know, it's it's very. I don't know what's the word for it. It's kind of like what what is it? What do they do? It's kind of yeah. a very like ubiquitous word, of course, in the industry. Crush. Where did it come from? Well, first we have to remind people it's with a C, not a K. Yes. Well, you guys, yeah, my former employers. Yeah. No, I'm sure there were some people going, what they're making. Wine? No, they can't afford to make wine. No, let's be real. <laughs> no, it, it actually came from my 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 family was on. We were on a doing a just a, a video chat, and my oldest daughter was launching a, a social media company. And the next day, she had a really big client that you know was going to be kind of let her breathe easy. And then my younger daughter was just starting her post college you know serious interviews, and the both of them are a little wound up, and we're on the phone, and like I'm like, girls, you know, you're going to crush this. And then everybody just like ding, 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 because we didn't have a name. Yeah. And I hear in the background, you know, somebody's, we got the domain. You know. You actually, Crush that. Vineyard wasn't. It didn't exist. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't have guessed that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What were you doing in OC before? Well, my wife and I met in New York City. We were retailers, fashion, you know, from fashion to farming. 
Wow. Um, then, I love the stories like this. Yeah, yeah. What people, does, you know, whatever they're doing, and whether, some people doing it very well, whatever industry they were in, you look at like the Bob Tillmans or the this or the that, people doing other things very well. Look at like Stanley and Elena, all the stories yeah, yeah. of there's being, me, coming here, seeing something that lights them up and then just desiring to like make that pilgrimage to make mm-hmm. the decision. So you were the, in the, you, the, in the fashion kind of, and retail. Yeah, we were, we were on that hamster wheel in Manhattan and it was, you know, 30 plus years. Did you have years. a brand or were you selling other people's? So I was, I was working for Saks Fifth Avenue. Okay. And Denise was at, we were at Office Romance. Yeah, never heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we both kind of did things. Once we had our first child, we decided, well, maybe we shouldn't have the same paycheck. Yeah. from the employer so yeah. separate out she went on to do some other things ultimately it was our kids coming west that brought us west mm. uh, oldest one went to uh, Chapman University in Orange and then the second one came and once the second one was coming we're like let's you know, let's go let's get on the wave and follow them there do you miss NYC? no 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 yeah <laughs> did it you know <laughs> 30 years got yeah. it check and then you did a little bit of LA or a little bit of Orange County yeah we were in Laguna Beach so we were looking for something that was you know a little more chill place that you could still walk around how long did you live there for moved in 2015 I mean we we came up here full time two years ago. So. Okay, so my fr- my one of my greatest friends, known since I was a sperm, he has a little brother who I used to babysit. That's hard to imagine. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess right. It's a little bit of exaggeration. I remember him. Right? I recognize yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, anyways, my friend Tim's little brother has a place called ABBA. That's the first race you ever won, wasn't it? Yeah. A H B A. In, in Laguna Beach. Anyways, I thought I'd ask because it's a place that's kind of blowing up down there. And I'm like, oh, here's little Nico with his own little spot. It's called ABBA. But anyways, you've never, never heard of it. No, no. I've never been there yet. I've been dying to. And I watch him on Instagram kind of blow up in Laguna. Interesting. Anyways, I thought I'd bring that up. Yeah. Anyway, so this is so cool. So this is happening this weekend. Damien, how can people learn more about this event to get tickets? My805tickets.com. It's all there. There's lots of things going on. Dinners, there's VIP tickets, there's seminar tickets, there's the grand tasting. And look, you know, how cool is it that someone's got inspired to go and start a winery and be Tanat focused from your blogs and my wine? It's and it sort of stuff happens all the time. And this is what these festivals are about, is inspiring some people to drink something else and something different, Get, find a winery they've never dis- discovered before, a style of wine or varietal they've never discovered before. And that's exactly, in, in a nutshell, what the Alternative Face Festival it is all about uh, it, finding something new. It's crazy, Adam. I hear so many stories of, you know, we look, we, grapes that we know and love, like Syrah and things sure. like that. Yet in the marketplace, they can be such a hard sell on a customer. You know what? It, it's, and that's exactly what these, this type of festival is, is about and why we're talking about it. It is not, you don't go to Albertsons or you don't go to Costco and, and find it to not section or an Albarino section. Actually, don't find that anywhere. So, but, the, the bottom line is the grapes are great and it's still a fairly new grape for California and we're still figuring it out, but we have a wealth of knowledge and experience and people who are willing to experiment and the wines are fantastic. And it's not just here in California, but they're making really great to not in Arizona. They're making Albarino in Texas in the high plains, for example. And there's a really, there's a lot of excitement about these grapes. And, and the more we talk about it, you might, our first order of business as wine professionals is to be able to pay our mortgage. Number two is to educate people. And we need to talk about things and get people excited about what we're excited about. If there's a grape that tastes like crap, we're not going to talk about it. But we love Albarino. We love Tanat. We love some of these really cool things, Pick Pool and all this other stuff. And it's just about getting people out of their little shell. It's not all about Cabernet. It's not all about Merlot. It's not all about Pinot. It's not all about Chardonnay. There's so much more. And we do it really, really well here in Paso Robles. I mean, that's yeah. why I've been I've been making wine for over 30 years. And Just I, and your I opinion, to not better a blender or better by itself? Well, if you, if, if you asked me before I tasted Paso Robles to not, I would have said it, it needed to be blended out. But he, this is the first place that I've ever tasted 100% to not that it was a complete wine from start to finish. Now, let's talk about, you know, aside from the conversation of blend it out, because I don't want to sound pejorative, but it does offer some really cool things in a blend. Mm-hmm. What would those things be? Color? Uh, well, obviously color, but there's also structure. You talk about depth and tannins, and I think it, it reminds me a lot of kind of Petit Verdot on a, on a different level, because Petit Verdot can be a little one-dimensional, and it's just all about tannins, 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 tannins. So you have to, if you're making a Petit Verdot, and you're trying. You're going for a hundred percent. You really need to find a way to be able to tame those tannins. You often do that in the 
fermenter, but you can also find other ways to do that. And I think with to not grow any, I, I'm not entirely sure because I'm still, for me, it's still a learning experience. I'll be, I'll be moderating the seminars that we're going to be having. And what I'm excited about is I'm actually going to be listening to these people and letting them tell me, you know, why they make it and how excited they are and how to make it. Because that's not a grape I'm familiar with as far as producing. I've made everything except for that grape. So I think when it's, it, it might be the perfect terroir. And it might be the perfect soil. It might be the perfect weather. I'm not entirely sure. These guys can tell me, though. How do you regulate, like, because you've been a guest on, you've been a panelist. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of differentiate, okay, I'm moderating this, I'm driving the bus, to I'm I'm a panelist. Have you ever moderated one before? I I have. Yeah. I've done, yeah. Do Do you have one that you prefer more? No, for me, it's when you have the opportunity, it's one thing to just sit in front of 120 people and do it. I just did this at the LA County Fair this last week and had a whole bunch of seminars. Oh, the old Pomona one? Yeah. I I used to go that every year growing up down there. Every year. Oh, good. I'm, Pomona. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you missed mine. They're 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 usually they're usually censored. Yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> but for what it's exciting about me and what I love, and this may be a microcosm of why I love winemaking is I get to work with other people who are all fantastic at what they do and bring in something different to the table. And so sitting up there as a moderator, I've got my my one mission is to provide a tiny little introduction, get people who are no know, know anything about the grape, give them a little background, and then let these people do their thing and just try to moderate the time so that we can get everything done in an hour. And for me, it's just going to be the questions that I have. I have nothing written. So the questions I'm going to have for them is I'm going to be learning from it, the things that I want to know and the things that I think that the people out in the audience are going to want to know. So, Wow. Scott, let me ask you, have you ever been on a panel that Adam Lazar is hosting? This will be my virgin voice. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Telling people. Yeah. This is going to really be fun. so rad. Oh, I'm such a big fan of you, Adam. I love it. Scott. Okay. So, Jason, you are also on this panel. What do you hope to bring to this uh, shenanigans? Something to sedate Adam. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bourbon. <laughs> to, yeah, real man. Yeah. Yeah. Barrel, barrel strength, is, please. Bourbon yeah. apparently is the mission. Yeah. Cast yeah. strength. Right. What am I hoping to bring to the panel? Blindfolds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we you... are doing the Chinat. Per- are you doing a blind portion. tasting? Yeah. Yeah, on the Chinat side of it, we side. are. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that was Scott's idea. So if it bombs hard. Yeah. No, no, we're, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. No, I can't wait we can for that. <laughs> Sherry, this sounds like a lot of fun. This uh, being on this panel and, and more. Tell me about what you hope to bring and kind of hope to educate folks on when it comes down to this. Um, well, I'll be bringing the fun. <laughs> everyone loves to hear a cork pop, and as soon as the bubbles start pouring, you know, everyone gets festive. You know, no one gets upset when you hear a champagne pop or No, not at wine. all. But also also trying to, I guess, highlight sparkling wine and Paso Robles. And, yeah. You know, doing it the, the correct, true, true method and... Also, it'll be a fantastic palate cleanser. I think we're kicking off, I assume, with the sparkling. And then, I mean, we're doing the full spectrum, a, a light, delicate sparkling to these big, heavy uh, tanats at the end. So it's gonna be know, I'm happy to be at the beginning of it. Yeah, that's going to be fun. And I think, you know, I want people to understand sparkling wine, as I know you, Lauren Chad, the whole Rava crew does, as something not just to open up on New Year's Eve or, they you know. some orange juice in it. Right, yeah, or even that. But, know. you know, on someone's anniversary. But just, I mean, like, bubbly is every day. Bub- and, you know, bubbly can be every day. You can drink bubbly For sure. all and the I, time. I think what people don't understand or maybe have experienced yet is it's so food friendly. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think if anyone's ever stumped, like, oh, what do I pour with uh, my dinner? A sparkling wine will always go with dinner, you know, I think. Fried um, chicken. Fried chicken. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, I love fried chicken and barbecue. Audrey got me this and... one book for Christmas a year or two ago, and it was, it's fantastic, and I wish I remember the exact title, but they take the craziest meals, whether it's like a number one for McDonald's to just random stuff, and they pair it with really cool sparkling wines. Oh. So Adam, let's do that next. Yeah, so not even like, <laughs> you know, like sometimes you'll get like a wine pairing book and it's like, well, really, am I going to cook that? But it's yeah. really accessible, quick things, you know, if you bring something from, from Panda, you know, here's yeah. what to do. I don't know, something <laughs> like that. So that's kind of cool. All right, Damien, work on that festival next. Yeah, there you go. Boom. Uh, okay. uh, Damien, tell me, because your wine is the one that is in the glass right now. Tell me about this this wine. Uh, so the, we, we have got an Albarino here that's made it with Acacia. And so rather than using 
Oh, are you talking about tonight or the, the, the yeah? So the acacia barrels here, and what it does is it gets away from having to use oak and the toastiness and the vanilla, but it still adds a richness and a mouthfeel. So this is actually a doff to the hat to Alan Kinney. It is the Kinney clone. It was planted on Jack Jack Ranch. This is why we're pouring it, and another. A varietal, or sorry, another clone from the same ranch is being poured in the seminar as well. So we can, we can, I think it's Adam. So we can actually compare the two and see what the and completely different winemaking styles. So this is a, a mostly done in acacia wood, three or four months leaf stirring, a little bit is in stainless steel, and yeah, sure, we uh, a little let one barrel go through ML and. It ends up being a richer style of Albarino, but you know, we're, you know, it's a great introduction to Albarino because you know, you, a, a lot of people grew up being the Pepsi generation, our uh, Chardonnay generation, and this is their segue, if you like, into Albarino. And what do you mean by that? Like this is kind of the gateway. It's like a yeah, gateway so, Albarino. So if you if you if you grew up with heavily oaked Chardonnays from oh, got so, it. Sonoma and Napa. Mm-hmm. And you want a transition, well, a steely Albarino that's all citrus, it's a big step. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like the segue into Albarino. It's the door in. Is that because of that one barrel with ML? Yeah, and it's also the the acacia wood, giving it a richness and and rounding it out. And and, and it it masks those natural, beautiful acids that are in there. Where's acacia wood come from? I guess American, right? There's a story behind that. Yeah. Uh, So it's originally America, yeah. uh, uh, But they export it to France, and they sell it back to us at a a huge expense with... uh, (laughs) Sounds perfect. Turn it into barrels, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get somebody on that. That makes no sense. Right. I love it. But is it because they want to put it almost like the French things? No, strangely enough, um, you know, I'm Australian, or I've got an Australian passport anyway, and and most acacia is... You're New Zealand. You're a Kiwi. No, I'm not. No, no, you're well. You're... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Behave. (laughs) No, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Anyway, so Australia has most of the acacias. Okay. And there's about 300 species of acacia, and this acacia is not one of them. This is actually a false acacia. So I lie when I say true acacia on the label. Faux acacia. Yeah, it's faux acacia. I mean, actually, I called it faux faux acacia. acacia. Yeah. Acacia. Yeah. Yeah, it goes well, pairs well with. uh, Focaccia. Acacia. Now, I want to taste this. Now, I guess I should get into uh, Scott. Pass that mic down to Scott because I'm going to get into this rosé first. This is a Tanat rosé. This looks like a Tavelle. This looks like almost like Gary Eberly's rosé back in the day where it was like a Syrah. Tell me the story behind this rosé because it's got like that Tavelle real deep feel to it. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's, it's a little warm now, but, you know, it's intentional. We farm it intentionally. We produce it intentionally. This came Meaning in. Meaning you pick it early. Pick it early. Direct to press. Yep. No. This no. actually, we treaded this for about 20 minutes. Okay. And then skin contact for two and a half hours. Cool. And then it went, so uh, pressed it into stainless for five months. Okay. So this is what we call our chillable red. Yeah. So it's really, so you don't even call it a, well. You, no, it is. It's a rosé, but, but, you know, but because we this, joke about it. Yeah, no, yeah. because it's, it's got that deep color to yeah. it. I love that. That's fun. Yeah. It's, you know, it's got a nice body. Uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of people love pairing it with grilled salmon. It also holds up at Thanksgiving really well. You're starting to see some of these, you know, Adam, whether they be kind of reds that have like that chillable red idea where it's a little bit of a deeper rosé or a little bit more softer reds like, you know, that we're, we're either we're putting, they're doing carbonic with them or we're sticking them in the fridge for a few minutes. That's becoming more and more of a thing, isn't it? Carbonic masturbation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so the, I think you, you see a lot of that. You know, we're, so, we're, so we're now growing a lot of varieties in Paso Robles, things like Sanso and Grenache and parts where it doesn't make a really huge full-bodied red and i think i personally think that all reds are better chilled and i agree in particular my, my you, fiance always says take your whites out for 20 minutes out of the fridge before yeah. you drink them put your reds in for 20 minutes yeah no i won't even eat at a restaurant that doesn't have the reds chilled to the proper temperature the and that's not just me being snobby it just you want you want it the red, you want the reds as, as they open up as they start to warm up all of these incredible aromatics start to release so if you have a syrup at a room temperature they're already gone by the time they hit the glass and so things like tanat which would be really this is really cool first time i ever had not rosé and it makes perfect sense to me but things like senso and and grenache and some of the light tempranillos from from la mancha in spain they just taste better Carnacha, they just taste better when they're they're chilled, and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, I mean, if it, ideally you just drink the wine at the temperature that, that feels right to you, and these 
are delicious like this. Yeah. I know you said, Scott, you were thinking it might not be cold enough. I think it tastes great. I think that's a fun wine. Thank you. Yeah, good job on that. Let's go right to the red because I haven't tasted your red yet. From Tantric to Tantalize, we are definitely going after a theme here, my man. Yeah, well, (laughs) so when we started the labeling, the naming convention was we wanted to take a couple of initials from the varietal. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. So, you know, Tantric, Tantalize, or Tempranillo's, Temptress, Temptation. Oh, got it. We have a lot of teas, so we got to kind of move off of that. Um, but what your report today is she's young. We're going to call her PYT, pretty young thing. I love that. <laughs> Favorite albums. Yeah, but she, actually, you know, we haven't even released this yet, but we thought, why not do it for today and why not do it for this weekend? Yeah. To, you know, see how people react to it. That's pretty cool. It may not, we may come out this fall. We'll see. It's yeah. a 21. This is a 21, obviously a great, so it's funny because we talked about coming into the business with Crush 2020. Oh my God, everything's yeah. going on. Yeah. World around is chaos. But- You're coming out of uh, the 2019 vintage was masterful. 2021 vintage, incredible. I mean, people are saying 23 is going to be like the best ever, ever, ever. 24 shaping up to maybe break that even year funk. That's something. Yeah. What are you seeing? Are you thinking 24 might be something you know, something special or what? I'm loving it right now. Everything looks so healthy in the vineyard. The flowering's right. It's warming up for us just in time for flowering. You know, one of the issues that we had last year was a lot of shatter around in some varieties because it was so cool and late during during flowering. So this year it looks like we're just warming up at the right time for us. Mm-hmm. Everything's just spot on in the vineyard right now. I'm, I'm just almost putting my foot up, feet up on the table, glass of wine in hand, just I feel like, sitting on the hilltop and watching it grow. I feel cro- like the wind, crossing my fingers, the wind was very similar to last year. The And I don't know if that's an issue with shatter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the temps, but for some reason, 23, we got a lot of early rain. Remember that? What, what are, did you see as you picked in 23 because of all that? And will there be any ramifications of when we pick in 24? because of all that crazy early rain of 23. There was a lot of rain actually last winter as well, between 23 and 24. It just spread out much more evenly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the theory was that they had so much vigor last year, you'd get all these big, vigorous canes this year. We're not necessarily seeing that. I think the you know, a lot of the grapes came in for us very, very late. So they had the super long hang time. We were literally picking before the first rain or picking before the first frost to get as much time as we could. And so the flavors were great and the colors were absolutely wonderful. You know, it's a muscular uh, vintage from flavor and color point of view. So going into 23, sorry, 24, it, it's early days yet, but we've had a nice start to things. Very nice start. That's good to hear. Very good. Wonderful. I want to know how we can hear about every one of us here, learn how we can taste our wines, and then, again, you can go to the link in the show notes, get your tickets for this event that is this weekend. Brecken, how do we learn more about you? Well, obviously, breckenestate.com. We're on Vineyard Drive in Paso Robles. But we, we make a whole bunch of wines across the Central Coast. You know, most of our Arborinos and things are sourced in what I would call the Slow Coast Appalachian, wonderful new Appalachian. And, and we're open 11 to 5 daily. Appointment's probably best if you can. But then if you want to just see us along with all these other wines, it's My 805 Tickets Alternative. Uh, My 805 Ticks. Yeah, right? I think it's Ticks. Ticks. Yeah. Ticks. I'll put the link in the show notes. Yeah, sure. I think it's My 805 Ticks, but yeah. yeah. So that's how you get hold of uh, Brecken. It's a wonderful tasting room under the shady oaks, in the old vines. Beautiful. We do small parcels. They last about two or three months, and boom, gone, we're on to the next thing. Very picturesque drive. It's just yeah. gorgeous out there. Scott, tell me how we can taste the crush. Crushvineyard.com, Tin City Annex. And do you need an appointment to get in there? No, please, come on in. Just come on in, taste the wines, baby. Let's do this. Adam, how do we taste uh, the Lazar wines and all of this, the beautiful stuff that you make? Hotrussianbabes.com. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> hold on a second. Um, <laughs> Le, sorry, lazarwines.com, and uh, you can get my information on there, and you can reach out to me if you want to come come by the loft here and taste wouldn't that be cool if you can go to hotrussianbabes.com and it's a good little czar? Yeah, we're, yeah we're, they're all engineers, by the way. So. Oh, I love it so much. Jason, how do we taste Bouchon? We have a wonderful downtown tasting room. Right How's on. that going, by the way? It's going great. Good for you. Yeah, killing it. And Isn't you- it nice to have Wine Fest over here at the event center so 
downtown can stay just, you know, people can park, people can come, people can visit. I think it's always best to have events at event centers. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's pretty, pretty appropriate. Good idea. No. He's got a it killer was, tasting room, by yeah, the way. It's it, really nice. Yeah. It was it was great to have it in the park, obviously. It was fun. But it had far outgrown that that, it that had, yeah. ability to facilitate it there. But anyway, we have Tasting Room Downtown. You can reach us at BashanVinchCompany.com. And I, do, I will have a new tasting room over by Tin City as well. Wow. Yeah, I'm expanding. I have my own production facility. So, but that won't probably be until after harvest. Where is this? Kind of on the outskirts of Tin City on yeah. Ramada. I just okay, have a cool. building, but it, I'm going to have an, a second tasting room for it, probably for the Analogique brand, and that'll be reservation only. But for the regular wines, we That's do exciting. take reservations. Good for you, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm super excited. That super. sounds rad. When do yeah. you, when do you hope to go online with that? Probably given everything going on and, and the late move in and the fact that we'll be hitting harvest, I, I don't anticipate I'll be able to actually get onto that until probably right around the holidays. And then yeah. will this be like what, where they call Ramada Row or even just right to the one no, side of that? No, this is this is like um, <laughs> this is kind of well, it 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 held a, a winery for a long time that didn't that was kind of it didn't function as a winery, but it w- it was there. And yeah. It was called Two Moons, and it's oh bill. yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, totally. it's right there on right Ramada. Along, yeah, I'm like I'm the closest closest winery to the fire station so like if, it, if you're feeling hot you just come <laughs> on over and then well i think it's cool because like we were talking earlier with scott like this area is seeing itself gr- you know graduate and evolve and mutate even bigger than just the borders of quote unquote tin city this urban tasting situation paso is all about it Ramada Row, you. I mean, this is, and yeah. then it's going to continue growing. And we'll see. It's a it stops in those vineyards, I guess. Yeah, you know? I don't see it stopping. Too. I have parking too. I have off street parking. You, you. And <laughs> actually, if you want to go you just beyond call it, me, I, just call it IHaveParking.com. <laughs> I, have, I have parking.com. I also have concrete behind me. So for if the you wind. just need concrete, yeah, yeah. Help you out there. <laughs> Whatever you need to do, we can get it for you right there. I love it, Jason. Right there. Oh, farms or farm supplies right there too? Yeah, there you go. What's your website Wine to taste wines? And- yeah, okay. right. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Like Website is bushongvintagecompany.com. Spell it. B U S H O N G Vintage Company. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a tricky name. It actually really is my name. I didn't just make all that. No, up. I just want to make sure there's no like hidden C in there or something. No, you know no I mean? hidden like, C's, yeah. no dashes, underlines, right, yeah. dots, nothing like that. Pretty the little, simple. The little dots over the if, o if you or just something. Google Bushong wine, I'm pretty much the only guy out there, I think, cool. at this point. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, hey, thanks for having us on, Adam. Oh my god, really it's so much fun. It. This was so you much fun. I mean? But I appreciate it anyway, and it's always a blast to talk to you. Yeah, it's cool, man. It's cool to catch up with you. I can't wait to catch up with you at your Yeah, uh, yeah. Your come by and see us at our new place. We can talk about Tin City Ghetto. But apparently, yeah. somebody already has that. Tin City Ghetto, oh, are they, they calling it that? No, no. No, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You're going to get the whole like English family all very upset right I now. Know. <laughs> and, and they're the hood, right? Yeah. Well, no, no, they no. Go, put the, the mic to him really quick. Yeah. What, what, what do they call the annex? Yeah, it's Tennessee. Are yeah. they calling it the hood? And no, like, I just do. That's my little, Oh, that's, yeah, that's because, my pet name. Yeah, it's a pet name. It's a pet I'm name. glad he doesn't have that trademark. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm the hood. Yeah, right. right. I'm the Tennessee hood, for sure. Oh my God, Sherry. Tin City Heights. There you oh, go. Shit. Well, the whole point is you can't use Tin City. If you saw that's... how short the ceilings were in my building, you yeah. would say that. Uh, Sherry, tell me about how people can taste the wines and learn more. Out at Rava Wines, we're promoting on the east side. I, I think the east side should get a little more love. We do the back roads out there. Just beautiful. The Rava property, if you haven't been there, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And we can accommodate large groups. We're open every day. And, well, Adam, you've been to. I've hosted it, many events there. there. Yeah, I love gorgeous. Chad and Lauren. They're the best. Yeah, I think it's fun to have a sparkling wine spot. And I think it's fun that folks who want to make sparkling that don't have the ability to, they can send it here rather than sending it yeah. three hours to Rack and Riddle North or something. They can yeah, do it exactly. Rava. And if, you don't, if you're a winery you know, that only makes one or two sparkling wines, it really never pencils out to have the equipment for that. And, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll take good care of your wine there. And yeah, also we do still wine as well. So if you go out there, it's great because, you know, maybe one person wants sparkling and one person wants still wine. We have food out there. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to come and hang out. Yeah, good stuff. All right. I can't thank all of you guys enough. This was so much fun. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Damien, Scott, Jason, Sherry, Adam. Cheers, folks, too. To two grapes that need a lot more love and they're about to get it. Yeah. Albarino and Tanat. Yeah. Cheers. Excellent. It's The Poor with Adam Montiel. You can hear The Poor in its entirety on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube Music, and wherever you get your podcasts. For more, visit adammontiel.com. Yeah.